exactly what the first panel is all about, the future of dairy. We all know the core ingredient of Mishti is milk. And uh, we have uh, with us uh, Sanju Malhotra, Vikram Doctor, Anmol Singh Narula, and in, in conversation with Rishika Das Roy Singhi, and I'll call uh, one by one uh, all of them on stage. And I'm very, very happy to uh, be a part of this festival. I'm going to call uh, the climate action leader that Rishika Das Roy Singhi is first on stage, who's the moderator of this afternoon's first panel. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Rishika. Thank you. We have with us uh, Sanju Malhotra, who's a nation branding evangelist and culinary diplomat based in Stockholm, promoting India in Sweden through his company. He's the CEO of India Unlimited. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Sanju Malhotra as he comes on stage. Besides, uh, thank you very much. Besides being uh, one of the patrons and friends of uh, Jugal's uh, Literature Festival, um, uh, Anmol Singh Narula, he's the managing director of uh, JOI, Joy Firm, and JI's group. Ladies and gentlemen, Anmol Singh Narula on stage. Thank you, Anmol, for joining us. Well, what a couple of young minds we've got together. We have with us uh, the iconic Vikram Doctor. I read his columns, his food columns every time. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Vikram Doctor, who's um, an editor of Economic Times, an encyclopedic source on the cooking life of India. Ladies and gentlemen, let's know the future of dairy, the core ingredient of Mishti from the experts. Thank you very much. Over to them. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out on a Saturday, uh, Sunday afternoon to discuss the two C's which seem to have become quite the buzzword. The first C with Valentine's Day around the corner, I'm guessing everyone's guessed it, cattles and cows. The second C will be climate change. Um, just to put this panel into context, we are discussing the future of dairy and our favorite mishti, given the high ecological footprint of this, right? Now, through the session, we'll try to stay away from jargon as much as possible. This is not a session just about climate change. We're gonna try and talk about what is a language that can connect the sustainability industry with the mishti industry. Now, everyone might be wondering, what is the context, right? Why are we talking about climate change? So presently, India produces 23% of the world's milk. That's roughly 200 million tons. Of this 200 million tons, 4 million tons is consumed by the Mishti industry of Bengal. So I'm guessing that's all of us as direct consumers of this Mishti. Now, it employs 100 million people, it's the single largest agricultural commodity, and it contributes close to 5% of our GDP. Now, this is quite a fact for a dairy insufficient country, or what it used to be. And the way we've got here is through a varied mix of combinations. Not a lot of it is in the formal economy. In fact, 80% of it is in the informal economy and it's unorganized and fragmented to, you know, to a certain degree. Now, why is it relevant to climate change? 16% of our greenhouse gas emissions is released by cattle. Now, let's take a minute to sort of unpack that. It might seem like 16% is not a lot, but it's only second to the energy sector and almost close to the aviation sector. So when we do speak about climate, the dairy industry becomes quite an important topic. In addition to this, there is the concept of invisible emissions, right? So when you look at a mishti or when you see a glass of milk, it's not necessarily just the direct impact. The indirect impact comes from the value chain or the supply chain, as it's called. So every time there is the question of fodder, there is the question of water, there is the question of ecosystem, it all adds to the complexity of this. In addition to this, and I promise I'll stop talking, uh, there is a human angle. 
the dairy industry is not just made up of statistics. There are real people. This is, you know, 100 million people depend on it. And there is a key link between keeping prices down, keeping prices affordable, as this is a huge source of protein for a large percentage of our population, and trying to understand how we can make it sustainable. So my first question for the panelists, and you know, we'll try to keep this as informal as we can, that the mishti industry in Bengal to a great deal has been locally embedded, right? So it's been locally sourced, the milk has been sort of been used following sustainable practices, but with the dairy industry becoming a massive contributor to climate change, where does mishti go from here? So, Sanju. Okay. Hello? Okay. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. I, I just wanted to add uh, a couple of points. One, one was about uh, uh, also um, how unhealthy diets are, are also uh, a cause of worry for us to think about and the huge amounts of food that gets wasted, uh, which I'm sure also probably happens in the milk industry. Um, so the, the good news is that change can happen and uh, it will happen if we learn how we can manage this, you know. Um, I mean, I personally love Mishti. You know, when, when I grew up in Calcutta, um, I was here till I was 10 years old. One of my favorite things every, not every day, but many days was to have hot rasogulla. Have you ever had hot rasogulla? Uh, it's like heaven on earth. But, uh, so I love Mishti. And I also love this planet. So we have to do something about this. Um, it's also interesting that, like you said, that they, it, in Bengal, there are two million uh, people working uh, in the milk industry, which Anmol, maybe it's gone up. I don't know, this was uh, 2017 or 18 statistic. And um, so how, where do we start? So from one point of view is to see, can we have a, you know, from a top-down perspective, um, of course, governments need to do something in terms of training and incentivizing and, and uh, financing the ch change needed. And on the consumption side, they have to talk, create awareness, you know? Is there an overconsumption? Is, can it be more conscious consumption? And, and so on. Then I think, um, I'm sorry, I made, made these notes because I have this uh, injury and I'm on some kind of a painkiller so my head gets fuzzy, so. Um, but I, d I definitely want to get off the high horse and not uh, sort of uh, po uh, pontify or um, uh, lecture, but I think it's important that um, we have to look at this with deep empathy and, and understanding, uh, keeping in mind the cultural context. Um, like you said, the Mishti industry in Bengal uh, consumes 65% of the milk um, that is produced. So I asked one question to Lahana. I said, how are you addressing, for example, waste? Uh, it was, and also what do you do with um, um, the Mishti that's not going to be used? Uh, so uh, what was really heartening to hear that um, um, uh, the water that is left out uh, after they make chena is used as a culture and reused the next day. And some of it is used to make ghee, even though if it's not a great um, uh, quality. But nothing gets wasted. And uh, old mishti, or it's not old, but just after one day, can be reused and used as a filler, uh, repurposed, or used in, in fried um, uh, objects. So this is a practice in the mishti industry. I think it's definitely a practice that Jugal does. And I said, have you informed consumers about this? Because this is something, you know, there's a practice of the industry which should be talked about. Uh, so that, I think, was um, is one point I wanted to talk about when it comes to uh, specifically to waste. 
Um, so uh, the second, and maybe Anmol will hear talk more about it, is uh, uh, sustainably produced milk, and I think you will get into that. So I won't I won't go there. Uh, but one thing I was thinking about is um, uh, is it available, like uh, naturally produced mishti or mishti from organic milk? Um, I know that uh, there's a place called Sundari, which is Bishwa Bengal. They have a kind of um, a no preservative, uh, no chemicals, mishti, uh, which I thought was very good when I saw that because I said, okay, that's a great present to take to people, you know. Um, there is, for me, I think the mishti industry uh, needs to come together. I, I would say the, a clarion call to the mystery industry to come together and talk about what needs to be done um, because as a, a stakeholder, they are a key stakeholder to bring change into the milk industry. So I would say um, that's a key factor. Maybe I'll just stop there for now. No, okay. Thank you for sort of kicking us off. Um, and Mol, do you want to perhaps come in and talk us through a bit about sustainable processes or just yeah. give us a lay of the land in I that sense. I think it's important first to understand how like milk, hello, okay yeah, it's important to understand how the milk industry kind of works in India. Milk sourcing is not an easy task in India because uh, in India there are about uh, 7.5 crore dairy farmers across the country and the average size of these dairy farms is one to two cows and that sounds a little um, weird because in the US uh, there are 37,000 dairy farmers in comparison and each farmer has about 250 cattle. So in the same way France it's about 30 or 37 uh, again 37,000 and they have about 50 cattle per farmer. So in India uh, for the most part it's women that usually run the show when it comes in the, in the, in the dairy industry and the milk that they produce most of it actually is used by the household that produces the milk. So only the excess is kind of sold into the market. So 46% is all that's left from that consumption that they do. I just want to say that's actually really fascinating because, yeah. you know, yesterday I think there was a session on the role of women in the industry and there's this perception that women are excluded from the, from the Mishti industry. But what right. you're saying is that the Mishti industry, which is male dominated, depends on the labor of all these all women, women. Who, are, who are raising the cows. Right, right. And so what, what they do is in these villages, it's, it's highly unorganized and fragmented. I would use that word. Because in villages, what they do is the excess milk that they have after they're done with household consumption, they'll go sell it to cooperatives who will kind of collect the milk in like these BMCs, which is bulk milk chiller units. And they do that across all districts in Bengal or throughout India, I would say. But the amount of money that they get is minuscule in the chain when it comes to the entire system. So the milk is collected from all these districts and bought into dairy processing units that are usually owned by large conglomerates, but there are certain small players also that are doing the same. Now, what happens is the, the supply of milk from these villages can never fulfill the demand that the dairy industry needs. So that's where you have these people called milk brokers that are like emergency contacts for most companies like, hey, I'm falling short of 1,000 liters of milk, can you supply it? And those are the elements in the milk supply chain that cause the adulteration because they're also, they see the money, they, they, they wanna make sure that they fulfill the demand, so they will usually adulter the milk, either with water, even water's considered adulteration in the milk industry. Then some, some of them even add synthetic milk powders, use vegetable oil, and in the 24 hour cycle, there is not enough time to really verify or thing. You can do it to a certain degree. There is basic protocols that you can follow, but for the most part, that's what causes the adulteration. And unfortunately, like in order for sustainability issues to be addressed in this industry, you will see a consolidation of some sort over time. Now that's a controversial subject in itself. They tried doing it in the farm industry and we saw what happened with the farm laws. But over time, corporations will seep in and you'll see a consolidation from whatever, seven, 75 million farmers to like a lower number that's more consolidated. But on the flip side, addressing sustainability issues and climate change issues will become better over time because of those things. 
Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I will say something of uh, uh, my own, but I, you know, uh, what's really fascinating, and I would like you, Anmol, to explain a little bit more about this. You know, one of the fascinating things about the Mishti industry in Bengal is that there is this parallel sort of Mishti industry in Bangladesh with the same traditions, uh, but without the, without the same, you know, which is, have, from what I understand, has faced far more problems uh, with milk, and I, you know, I would really love to hear from you a little, maybe a little later, about your perceptions of how Bangladesh has addressed these problems, because it's a country, as I said, with the same milk, uh, Mishti traditions, uh, but which is facing climate change in an even starker way uh, mm -hmm. than, than India. And I, and I think, from my perception, for instance, one of the things they've done is they've accepted the reality that a lot of Mishti will be made with milk powder right. and, and things like. So, you know, I would like to get your perspectives on so this. In, in Bangladesh, things are a little different. So when it comes to like per capita consumption of dairy and mishti or chena is much higher in this, this country because most people are lacto-vegetarians. In Bang there's a direct correlation in most data where you'll see if the meat consumption goes up, the use of dairy falls down, which is the case in Bangladesh, but Bangladesh still makes two. But the big thing is that they use a lot of buffalo milk Buffaloes are more resistant to the weather that we have here, and buffaloes are somewhat an answer to the questions that we are looking at is what should be done for sustainability, which I can go into more depth later about why buffaloes are a better choice for Bengal than cows. Okay, I definitely want to hear this because uh, buffaloes are something I'm very interested in. But I'll just say, you know, for first, you know, uh, thanks to, uh, uh, to uh, Jugals for inviting us. I mean, I said this is an extraordinary festival. Uh, more than that, this is an extraordinary venue. I have taken part in so many like events like this, and I've never been in such an extraordinary historic venue like this. And uh, from what Luhana tells me, this is entirely due to her father's contacts with the government. And I think that's a uh, tribute to like the power of the Mishti industry <laughs> in, in Calcutta that they can command a venue like this, which is apparently the first time it's been given out for an <laughs> event like this. Um, I will just say that, you know, uh, uh, I write on food in general, but my particular interest in Mishti, apart from studying in Calcutta for two years, uh, came, you know, with a story I wrote in, along with a colleague of mine, Ritankan Mukherjee from the Economic Times, uh, Calcutta, on uh, this amazing story of the one chief minister in, of, of uh, West Bengal who actually tried to ban Mishti. And, I'm, and as I said, you know, there are certain historic le lessons for the future to be learned from history. So, and since I've realized a lot of people definitely outside West Bengal don't know the story, I'll quickly go over it. It's a fascinating story. The chief minister in question was uh, Prafula Chandra Sen, uh, the last, chief, last Congress chief minister of, uh, of, of West Bengal. And in 1965, uh, he imposed a ban on the use of milk uh, for, 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 making, uh, for making mishti. Um, and his reasons were very simple, that the, the, this was pre-white pre -white revolution, pre-operation flood, and milk, was, uh, milk su supply in, in Bengal in particular was, was very, very low. And as a very principled, upright, very Gandhian figure, he felt that a mishti was an ir irrelevant indulgence to some extent, and he also felt that the, the, the milk should be kept for women and children. So he imposed this, the, uh, this, this ban. And you know, for this story, Ritankar went around talking uh, to uh, the, 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 the sweet industry, to the, the Mishti industry. And as I said, it's a story that's been largely forgotten in the larger world, but for the Mishti industry, this memory is, is vivid. I mean, he, he got like almost visceral reactions from the Mishti makers saying, oh my God, that was like the, 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 the darkest time. We had, to sell, we had to sell our ornaments to be able to survive. You know, the, the ultimate Indian-like thing, you know, our women had to sell their ornaments uh, 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 to survive. And this, the story becomes really interesting because uh, 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 PC Sen imposed, uh, imposed, uh, imposed the ban. It was challenged in the Calcutta High Court, and the Calcutta High Court struck it down, uh, to which PC Sen then imposed an even, he got really angry, and imposed an even more sweeping ban, which was also struck down by, uh, by Justice Banerjee in the, in, the, in the Calcutta High Court. And you know, all these orders are available on Indian Kanun uh, to read, and I really urge anybody who's interested to read it because they are fascinating. The amount of detail that you get about the Mishti industry in the 1960s is extremely vivid. You know, it's, it's preserved in these documents. And then, not only does it get struck down, then 
it, the whole matter for a very complicated reason goes up to the Supreme Court of India. And I think this is an ultimate moment for Mishni when, you know, it is, it is you know, ruling politics in, in Bengal and the Supreme Court of India is, 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 discu is, is discussing uh, Mishni. And ultimately, actually, PC Sen loses because uh, his colleagues in the in the Congress, you know, decide this is just too radical. He's, he, you know, this is just unrealistic for a politician, and they kick him out. The uh, the uh, Bangla Congress is, is briefly formed, uh, and till date, uh, the Congress has never come back to power in, in Bengal. And to some extent, it's the curse of the Mishti uh, <laughs> hanging over the Congress. Uh, now, why am I bringing up this this history? Because, uh, you know, for all th that he was obviously a really bad politician, uh, PC Sen did have, have, make, have, you know, did do two, two things that I think were important. First, um, he forced the Mishni industry to think outside of the world, outside Bengal. I think th this was when KC Das, for instance, opened its first outlet uh, in, 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 in Bangalore because uh, they realized that we cannot depend upon Calcutta where, you know, these sort of the orders can be passed on us. The second is, for all that he was an unrealistic politician, we must appreciate that he was doing this for a very principled reason. Uh, he was right. I mean, if there is such limited amount of milk, you have, it, it, it should go to those who need it most. And today, luckily, we are not in the same position. But issues of like climate change are the current issues, are, are, this, are the, the parallel of those issues of that time. So hence, the question that PC, that, that now as I said, I. You know, this is not a session to bash dairy. I don't think any of us wants to bash dairy. None of us are, are, are saying that, you know, we have to end like dairy now. But the question has to be raised, even for the Mishti industry, that it might be essential for your products, but is this a really sustainable project product for the future? And as we know, and I think you may be able to tell us a bit more about this, there are all these fascinating, uh, you know, plant-based alternatives coming out. Should the Mishti industry be looking at these products? We will come to that in a minute. No, but thank you for raising a very critical point, which is the need for radical ideas, right? Radical times need us to sort of break away from the status quo and challenge certain concepts. So my question to the panel is that if there are people who work in climate change, who are looking at data, who are looking at statistics, and there are people who are working in the dairy industry, how will they actually communicate with each other, right? Because what are the incentives? What is the story that we can tell to incentivize the dairy industry to do something about climate change? Because human nature is such that if you sort of tell them that you're a 16% emitter of greenhouse gases, it doesn't mean anything, right? For small agrarian groups or even large agrarian or uh, dairy groups, how do we have the most impact in sort of shifting the conversation about dairy and climate change in India? Do you want to take this, Anju? Uh, 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 yeah, sure. Uh, I think, uh, as I said, um, the way forward is, first of all, to uh, get the, the Mishti industry together, which is obviously a very powerful uh, milk lobby in Bengal. Uh, because of the amount of milk that they consume. So they really have the power to uh, bring real change. Um, uh, there can be several pathways to do this. And I think there is nothing, nobody's taking milk off the table. It's about trying to um, secure milk that has been produced in the most sustainable way. But it can start with small things. It can start with the welfare of the milk producers uh, in those villages. You know, let's ta start with them. You know, the ones who are actually doing the hard work to get that milk to the cooperatives and then, then to the, um, uh, the Mishti um, uh, makers and, and so on. So that's one, one way to do it. Um, it can start from the welfare of the animals uh, and that they are, if they are better looked after and less ill, that's actually very good for the climate. You know, so they can be small um, incremental uh, changes in the short term. In the long term, yeah, they have to sit together and create a roadmap of what are the different parts that they can look at. They can also look at alternative methods, for example, looking at plant-based 
and saying, can we introduce some parts of it? Can we create hybrid versions, for example? Let there be some 50% <laughs> milk-based and 50% plant-based, and you know, that's a path forward. You don't have to do a radical shift, but you can do a small shift, and then you have actually done something. Uh, you can make changes in the Mishti industry in terms of how they package and distribute and so on, and, and where they can actually make small changes. Um, you can you can do by making it like look at social sustainability. Can it be a more inclusive workplace by, to bring more women, for example, um, uh, who make mishti? I know that there's this project about uh, tribal women uh, who have learned to make mishti and are now selling that. So there are uh, so many pathways. So yeah, you know, coming back to the. The 1965 and the PC Sense story. Even at that time, I mean, uh, from what the, the, the inputs we got from the, uh, the from the Mishti industry was uh, at big, one response to the PC Sense order was actually to innovate at that time and to try and uh, to try and bring in sweets made with basin and and and, and, and other materials. And um, while while you know uh, this may be controversial, I think one thing that sh that sh that the Mishti industry should appreciate that it doesn't have to be defined by dairy. To me, what defines the Mishti industry as opposed to the Halwais and all the other sweet uh, traditions in India is the extraordinary creativity uh, uh, in, in, uh, of, of the Mishti in, in, in industry in Bengal, that using just these basic materials of milk and uh, sugar and a few other ingredients, they have come up with this vast variety of sweets. So, to me, if you look at the, if the, if the secret of the industry is not milk, but creativity, then that creativity can, can be used on all types of ingredients and come up with all types of sweets uh, in, in the future. And the other point I'll, I'll quickly make is that we actually have these traditions. It's not something new. India is the one country which has, uses milk from multiple sources, not just cows, but buffaloes and camels and sheep. I don't know if you ever heard this, this term called Chicago milk, which is Goats meant to be also. sheep, camel, goat, okay. <laughs> which, which, which you hear in Western India. And Chicago milk is the milk of sheep, camel, goat, which actually should be priced separately, but it's just dumped into the main uh, milk, milk supply. And also we have these multiple traditions of sugars. And you know, uh, while this session is about dairy, sugar is also something we need to consider in terms of sustainability because cane sugar is an incredibly unsustainable crop. I mean, why, why should just dairy get the bashing? Cane sugar is an incredibly unsustainable crop from an from a, 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 a aquaculture point of view. And uh, the Mishti industry in Calcutta has always looked at other sources of sugar. So, you know, maybe this is where you, I'd love to hear you talk about the importance of buffaloes and other sources right. of milk. Um, just on yeah. that, do you want to come in on innovation first though, because we're talking so, more through yeah, creative. Yeah, I was going to come to that. So, I, I do, I, I'm forgetting the name of the economist. Uh, this was in the 1800s that had predicted the end of the world because of the population growth. And his entire speech was about how the world's going to end because it's not sustainable for so many people to live in a defined space. And his calculations were not wrong, but he, what he forgot to factor in that technology does progress and that progress in technology can support those changes. And I think it's quite radical to say dairy needs to be uprooted and thing because dairy is quite essential for a lot of people, especially in a country like India where, again, meat consumption is much lower. Now, the flip side is culturally, if dairy goes out of the equation, people then have to shift to something which is a form of protein. So it's either meat or, you know, in some countries, it's soy. Soy is far greater when it comes to using resources, and it, it is, again, not completely sustainable. Uh, the other option is meat, again, which is huge. In, in the U.S., we've seen there, you know, the methane uh, emissions because of the meat industry. So I don't think it's just related to mishti and milk consumptions. I think as a broad, as a culture, uh, if we are to make the shift, that something else will go up. So the better answer is incremental sustainable things as Sanju was saying, the small things that can happen. For example, uh, let's take um, cows, the fodder that they use, they use uh, hay. Instead of that, if you shift to a grain-based diet for, a, for some breeds, it is better for methane emissions. Mm. And there are small, small components that can be changed. For example, logistics. So, if there was, you know, the cold chain that is required to run the milk industry because we're going to far off districts to get milk, that cold chain emissions is far greater. So we can already reduce that if 
the planning is done better at a their state level or a national level, which they have done in Gujarat with you know uh, uh, Amul being uh, a role model in that co-op kind of model where they've consolidated those resources. So I think there's a lot more to do with that. Then there's also packaging that we can look at. So we can, which we can again talk about because you know milk comes in packets here and which is not really sustainable at all because of the thickness and things like that. So I think there are a lot of small components that could be addressed before going with the radical step of completely changing the culture with say just plant-based alternative <laughs> because those use resources as well. No, I but, but what about agree. the semi-radical step of shifting to water buffaloes? I mean, that's what I really wanted to hear. Because just to sort of uh, come back yeah. on that, I think what we're trying to get at is context. So the dairy industry is highly variable and the supply chain can be greened at different steps. So what makes sense is to find those entry points. Mm. So yes, we need the policy shift that's top down and then what Sanju was saying, we need incremental action on the ground as well. But you know, at some point we need to understand where to bring in consumers into this conversation. Mm. And that's where I want to get to that, you know, are consumers interested? Is there a market for eco-friendly mishti? Do people realize the ecological footprint of Mishti? So that's just one more idea mm. for you all to so sort this of... this is actually where the water buffalo question gets really interesting. Uh, because India has always depended upon water buffaloes in a very large way. I'm sorry, I'm slightly obsessed with water <laughs> buffaloes. I've written a lot about water <laughs> buffaloes. So this is a subject very dear to my heart. Um, the, the reality is that water buffaloes are vital to India rather than cows. There are parts of India, yes, which are suited to cows, but very large parts of India, certainly all of coastal India, which includes uh, uh, Bengal, and large parts of uh, riparian uh, the, along the rivers, uh, water buffaloes are the traditional source of milk. And the Amul revolution was built on water buffaloes. This, this is you know, what has been forgotten over the years. Most of uh, Dr. Kurian's challenges in the early years of Amul had to do with how to make products like condensed milk out, out of water buffalo milk, which Western technologists who are only focused on cows said wasn't possible, but he cracked those problems. And for whatever complex reasons, which I won't get into the moment, we, we are now pushing cows, cows, cows. And it's also something that comes from the consumer end, because there is a strong consumer perception that cow milk is good, whereas water buffalo milk is, is, is not. Now, how does this, 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 this perception change? Because you're right, See, water buffaloes is what we should be moving to, yeah. especially in Bengal. See, buffalo, they're far more disease resistant. So one of the big benefits of that is that you don't have antibiotics in your system the same way cows do. Cows are extremely sensitive when it comes to their diet, how, how they have to be raised and things like that. While, while buffaloes are more suited to the environment that we live in, well, most of India. And the thing is the pendulum when it comes to consumer trend keeps on shifting. So earlier, like 10 years back, people wanted Holstein cows that were these you know, foreign exotic breeds and people didn't want desi gai ka dood, that wasn't a thing. And now there's been a complete shift to desi gai ka dood because of whatever reason it may be. And the thing is that both ends of the spectrum are not really sustainable because foreign breeds need more resources, they're far more prone to disease, but their yields are high. But then the desi guy, the yield is very low. That means you're using more space, more fodder to try to produce the same milk, which is also not sustainable. There was an answer in the middle with mixed breed cows, which is still there. But buffalo milk, for some reason, doesn't get the same love that cow milk does. Even though buffalo milk is per ml has more nutrients in it, more, more calories, which is one reason, but more nutrients in it. It is far better for making cheeses. So Italy completely relies on buffalo milk for its gelatos and its cheese. But in India, even the mishti industry here, try making rasogulla with you know, different types of milk and you'll see the difference. But people here for some reason have this, sorry to use the word, fetishization with cow and cow milk, which might be unfounded in a lot of ways. So, so how much of the milk in the mishti industry in Bengal is actually from buffalo milk, whether that, they want to admit it or not? I, I would say majority is buffalo. Oh, okay. I, I think Lahana can give a better answer, but yeah, it is. Just to sort of come in on that, I think it's important, what you said hits the nail on the head, right? So basically what it does from a climate change point of view is that buffaloes and cross breeds make the process less emission intensive because they consume less water, require less inputs. And the minute that component comes down, the emission conversation becomes you know, salient again. 
But um, coming back to consumers, how do we how do we brand this new phase of Mishti? Is there a market for conscious consumers? Is there a need to go that way? What are your thoughts on this? Um, so I, I just wanted to add to that conversation first was that uh, for the Mishti industry to look at different plant-based alternatives and I've been thinking, what about like millet-based milk? Because uh, certain millets like ragi have very high level of calcium and so on, so can be a very interesting um, uh, replacement, although from a consumer point of view, it's all about taste and texture, you know, and, and finally the pricing, of course. But if the taste and texture is, it changes even slightly, the most conscious ones are just going to discard it. So that is a critical thing. So in a way, you have to kind of set up an R&D lab or a culinary lab to test all this, you know, because, I, and I think this is, again, I'm saying the Mishti industry must do it jointly as a, Take it up, test different things and see what works because at the end it's the individual um, shops that are going to do their own creative uh, expressions. You will start, they will start addressing a market. Maybe it's small, but it's growing. There are people who are conscious and would like to have these alternatives. Uh, they might be people who are lactose intolerant like I am. Maybe because I moved abroad and I became, because the A1, A2 right. story, I don't know, but I definitely became, you know, and I can't do without my dahi. But I've also moved to, like, my milk has become just oats, you know. I, I mean, so I, I do part, you know, I do that, but I also have that. So this is also what consumers will do. You can't, I, I'm not uh, radical, I'm not vegan, but I eat everything, but I, I make certain choices, you know, and I think, this kind of a flexitarian or hybrid way is, I think, a way for a lot of consumers because everybody wants to, but then they, if they don't have the choice, what do they do? But one thing I'd add is plant-based milk is fine for drinking milk, so if you're adding it to your coffee or chai, but it might not work in all ways for complete, like, dis I, I can I tell I made gajar ka halwa with uh, Oatly's, um, it's a barista quality right. milk. It was fabulous. I mean, you couldn't, I couldn't make out, you know, that it was the college, I mean, whatever the condensation then, did right. was fabulous. So I don't know about the, the yeah. paneer part, but I'm just but saying. But then I'll, I'll have a flip side question is in order to give you the same texture as milk, you have to add thickeners and emulsifiers. Uh -huh. Are so you they, okay with that then? So. But plant base, a glass of plant base uses nine times uh, less land than, but, than a glass but of then I mean, there is a, I'm just giving you the, the comparative yeah. right. But then there's also the flip side about, is the price point accessible for everyone? Yes, so, so affordability I, I have a, I, So I have a, uh, responses to some extent. One is, you've okay. actually told us that the, it's already happening. If, if at surge times, uh, the milk brokers are, 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 making, are manufacturing milk out of vegetable oil right. and, and milk powder, then I'm sorry. The, 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 the chemicals are already in the in the in the, in, sure. in, in, in the supply chain. So that's one. Um, the, the 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 second point is that uh, plant-based milks. Uh, a there is so much research happening in the West. I mean uh, that we we uh, the, the new types of, of milk of plant-based milks that are coming up um, are, could actually. Uh, it's not just Oatly. There are all these products, new mm. products coming up, particularly based on yellow pea protein. Uh, which, 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 which could actually uh, resemble milk very closely. We have seen this happening with plant-based meats, which are now actually quite extraordinary. Um, so that's one. Secondly, plant-based milks are not, not new. They have been traditional to India for ages. Mm. Coconut milk is traditional across the West, West, uh, across the west Coast of India. Pop cotton seed milk is traditional in parts of Tamil Nadu. Uh, poppy seed milk is traditional in parts of, 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 of Karnataka. And there are desserts made with these. Now, would these, could these be used for mishti? I don't know. But maybe new types of, 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 of mishti could be made from them. And the last point about cost. See, this is a really interesting point because things happen when you happen on scale. Now, one of the most delicious plant-based milks, it is absolutely delicious, is, is cashew milk. It's one of the easiest things. I make it once a week my, uh, uh, in, in myself. And it's just, it's like making coconut milk, you, in, except you, you use cashews. Now, obviously, the first thing everybody's saying is, is this guy mad? Cashews cost so much. Uh, how is this ever going to become uh, viable? Now, why do cashews cost so much? This is a really interesting question. Uh, cashews cost so much, not because the plants are, 
Other nuts take very long to grow. To grow. That's why they're expensive. Cashews grow very fast, okay? In, in about three or four years, a, a cashew shrub, it's not even a tree, will be, produce, will, will be, will, will be producing uh, cashew nuts. They grow on degraded land, so that you're, not take, they're, you're not taking over uh, land that could be used for, uh, for other products. The only reason cashews are expensive is because of the huge processing that's needed to, to, uh, to, uh, to get them out in that perfect cashew shape. That's, that's almost impossible to mechanize. That still has to be done by hand, and it's a very difficult process because the outer shell uh, is, very, uh, uh, is very acrid. That process is done by hand. This is the biggest bottleneck in the cashew industry, and that's why cashews are expensive. But if you're going to use them to make milk, you don't need whole cashews. You can use broken cashews. I don't use whole cashews to make milk. I use broken cashews, which, as I live in Goa, are, are easily available. If the purpose of making of, of processing cashews is to produce cashew milk, the whole process can be mechanized. So costs can come down if things are done on scale. Sorry. No, no, so um, we have been asked to sort of wrap up the conversation because okay. we're running out of time. Um, there were a couple of more points that I wanted to discuss on the circular economy and just how we can deal with packaging, etc. cetera. But uh, I'm just gonna quickly check with the organizers how much time we have. Five minutes, 10 minutes, okay. Clearly we can go on. Um, so just in terms of thinking of where we can go from here, how do we see sustainability in the dairy, uh, you know, dairy industry to give us some sort of competitive advantage? So in Bengal, Mishti is quite our crown jewel, right? How can we in Bengal become the champions of a sustainable dairy industry? How can we actually make that happen? So I'm going to request each of you to sort of uh, give concluding comments for this, and then we can just maybe wrap up. Do you want to go first? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I really think that, uh, you know, I've always said that Calcutta is like the culinary capital of India. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm like, I just love Calcutta and I love Bengal and I love Vishti. So I just think it's so sad that it's not known and not seen and not heard of. So uh, I, I feel that uh, uh, one potential path ahead, I mean, if you look at the cheese industry and look at what France and what Italy and, and, and these countries and how they <clears throat> have developed place-based branding, you know, the connecting. Uh, so they are dif in different parts of Bengal, you have different kinds of Mishti. Now, Imagine that those areas become kind of like a culinary center, which is also creating all kinds of employment for all kinds and making it inclusive and, and, and so on. And then suddenly these becomes like a, a network of um, interesting uh, destinations and, and hotspots. Of course, uh, the, um, if you add the element of um, uh, sustainability to the produ produce and the products, uh, it the quality and, and uh, all that will improve. It will also hopefully beneficial uh, the people working there so that they get they are better paid and so on. And then this can be used as a branding um, uh, for uh, the, uh, the uniqueness of that particular mishti connected to the story of that region. I think all that is something people, you know, you, you see one thing and you say, where's this come from? What's the story behind this? I don't know. You know, you go to a shop, you know, you know a little bit about one or two things, but the rest is I'm completely lost. So I think that, that connecting sustainability to culinary tourism is one potential idea of uh, showcasing this jewel in the crown, you know? I think I'll agree with you. I think um, well, the same way like Europe's done a very good job of marketing its, uh, you know, products and showing the artisanal quality, which um, in India and Bengal, we can work on a lot. For example, even our Nolan Gore, uh, I think it's very underappreciated outside Bengal. It's like our maple syrup, but Canada gets all the thing for tapping a tree and getting a syrup, but we don't really appreciate it as much. Yeah, yeah. and same thing with buffalo milk. Like, I, it's more sustainable than cow milk for these regions, but people don't respect it the same way. But in Italy, they do. I think it's all because of marketing and how they've been presented those things. So I think there are things that, th those are the things where it, the branding and the conversation, like you were mentioning, should change around Mishti. Like, I didn't know how um, the depth of Mishti until I started talking to Lahana about the Mishti industry. And it's absolutely crazy. And it's, it's very underutilized till date. 
I think the answers are already there, you know, in, in, the, in the Mishti shops. And, the, you know, look at the rise of diabetic Mishti. Okay, when diabetic mishti was uh, was introduced, it was a sort of a joke. I mean, like people are saying, how can the mishti industry? But now I think most large mishti shops will have a, 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 a few trays of, 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 of diabetic mishti. And to me, that's an example of how when there is demands, which may not exist initially, but it's important that the products are put out there, that this is talked about, that people talk about the fact that, that you know, buffalo milk is important, that, that you know, all these other uh, sort of ingredients are, are possible. As, you know, and it's not like uh, uh, low, uh, low dairy uh, sweets are anything new uh, uh, in, in Bengal. For, uh, the one example, of course, is, is Joy Nagar Moa, uh, which uh, a product that uses actually very little dairy compared to other products. I, I think Joy Nagar Moa is a wonderful product. I wish it was more widely available in, 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 in sweet shops here. And that, to me, that's an example of a very traditional uh, low dairy uh, Bengali sweet. So, it can happen if, the, if diabetic mishti can become a fixture in mishti shops. I, I see no reason why low dairy uh, mishti cannot also become a, a thing. Thank you. Sanju, did you want to come in or should we move to the audience in case anyone had questions? Uh, yeah, definitely ask the audience first, maybe. Any questions for our panelists? We've. Can we get a mic down there, please? There's one question. Um, thank you so much for all the insight that you just uh, told us about how dairy farming, consumers, chefs and artisans and craftsmen need to come together to be able to provide a more sustainable uh, environment for dairy and use plant-based products at the same time. Uh, I wanted to pick your brains and ask you all a question about the larger, larger picture altogether uh, when it comes to sustainability. I think as a, a society, it's more important for us to be able to have enough food to put on the table. And in the long term, how is it as people who are producing dairy, um, cooking with it and even consuming it, um, and not only just the dairy industry, because the food industry all as a whole are interlinked, and you spoke about it with both the dairy and the meat industry as well. How, what is it that we can do as a society uh, at a governmental level or people who are actually in the food business as well to ensure that sustainability is something that drives our practices as compared to consumerism, that, that's the norm in the industry today. Thanks. Any more questions? One question there and one question at the back. We'll take the questions together and then maybe direct it towards the panel. Uh, hi. Um, so for the, we didn't really get a definitive answer to whether the people of Bengal will uh, accept eco-friendly mishti or not. So can they, I mean, of course it depends on price and texture and all of those aspects, but is there a yes or no to that answer? That's a good question. And we had one last question somewhere at the back. Hi. Uh, I don't think, well, I'm Shweta Jain. I'm just curious, like, you're talking about sustainability. I don't think sustainability of Mithai is challenged because um, <laughs> where I don't, uh, the plastics are a major um, problem. And the companies are bottling it, making it like cheap, and and I don't see the government tackling it. And where the food tastes are there, like mitai, and you're talking about uh, like sustainability. Of course, um, there will be like um, automation, something different. But where mitai is concerned, where dairy is concerned, <laughs> as long as None lives, there won't be a problem. I can vouch on that. And uh, uh, you were talking about the cow thing, like the mentality does not come from, um, it's like, um, uh, uh, it comes from various reasons, you know, like uh, you were discounting cow's milk. It's uh, mostly to do with digestion. There are reasons why people prefer that. I don't know much about all these technicality. But as a common person, just listening to you all, um, 
I was just thinking about it. C can I answer the question about yes, please, digestibility? Please, please do that. Uh, with uh, milk, it has to do with uh, fat and lactose which are both things that can be worked on, which is lactose can be made, milk can be made lactose free by adding enzymes. And when it comes to fat, that is already a practice where you can adjust the fat levels in milk, which can help digestibility. So that buffalo milk has nothing to do with digestibility in that way. And yeah. So I see one couple of questions, but I'm gonna to have to check with the organizers if we have time for it. Uh, do we have time? Do we not have one question? One last question. I saw you first, so the question's going to go to you, the lady at the back. I would request, though, n not for specific comments, but questions yeah, to the panel. Yeah, it is a very specific question. Uh, since you said a lot of uh, milk actually comes from water buffalo, so is cow's milk a sort of myth? Also because there's been a lot of crossbreeding of cows, as we know, uh, in the history of India, including Bengal, right? So is cow's milk a sort of a mythical status or uh, is it also called under the name of Deshi Goru or indigenous breeds? It's also a lot of crossbreed milk that people are consuming. The sweet meat industry is consuming, but probably there is that mythical acceptance that it is cow's milk. So it's... It but cow's milk still exists, there are cows, they're, they're real, real cattle, but, uh, and the milk is present in the industry. Uh, it's just that buffalo milk is easier to work with sometimes when it comes to these products because the fat is higher, so you can get better results when it comes to cheeses and such. So a lot of fattier cheeses, even in outside India, like in Italy, are made out of buffalo, cheese, buffalo milk for that reason. The curds come out better, the texture is better. Uh, but yes, cow's milk is there, but it's mostly for drinking consumption that people prefer it. So just to sort of come back to the panel, we had one question on individual action for climate change. So meat and dairy, we had one question at the back, and then I think you've answered the question on cow versus buffalo for now. Um, so any last sort of comments on climate, why this is becoming relevant, or if you'd like to address anything specifically? I mean, uh, you know, uh, if, you know, with respect to the question from the back, uh, I think it's it's sort of patronizing to say that issues like sustainability do not matter for the common person. I mean, the common person is very well aware of the effects of climate change. We are facing it, all of us, on a daily basis. Um, and as I said, look at the parallel with di with diabetic mishti. I mean, 20 years back, you know, people had very little idea of. Of, of diabetes and, and insulin and, and issues like that. And, you know, it was like, yes, drink sugar, put more sugar in, in your milk, etc. cetera. Uh, today, there, there is a very widespread uh, awareness of what diabetes the, the, is doing to our, our country. We don't even use the word diabetes. You know, sugar is now used as, 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 as a medical term. You know, sugar is used as, the, as an industry by, by ordinary people. Um, and this, there is this awareness of what sugar is, is as, a, as, as a problem. And... The common person knows that that you know overuse of sugar and the the cost that diabetes is doing to the to to, in, to the health of India is a, is is a real issue. So I see no reason why the common person will not accept the reality of climate change and sustainability. Uh, look at young people in the in the West. Young people in the West are leading the way on the conversation on on, on climate change, and it will happen in India too. I think it's uh, already happening and. Uh one shouldn't uh, underestimate um, uh, that, you know, because that movement and that change has come. It, it also is connected to the goals set by the country for net zero emissions. So it's a pathway that we all have to go to. There is, uh, it's too late to uh, turn back. There's no, uh, and it's more about adapting and to uh, see where can you mitigate and where are, and that's why we want to find more creative solutions. and. I would like again to say the Mishti industry, take up the baton and make the disruptions they need to do and don't let somebody else come from outside and do it, you know, because you keep the power then within. I think this is a key message and for that they need to come together and collaborate. This is a very critical thing. If they do not do it, it will be, you know, years later, and then the, it was, it'll be a bit too late, you know. So that's one, one clear message. The other thing is if you compare Mishti to something else, 
um, another kind of food. I mean, there is other sweet things. And I mean, I don't know, maybe mishti for me is much more sustainable if I would compare to some other kind of <laughs> sweets, just to make a comparison. It's handmade. It is um, a traditional craft. Uh, it supports the entire um, ecosystem. Um, it also requires that the people who are making it should be recognized for that work and their status needs to be increased and improved because they are the master craftsmen, you know? So the more we treat people for the work they do and increase that value, then the, you, know, you change the value of the product and, and so on. So to me, it's also, that's the positioning, you know? And then you can talk about branding because you have to raise, put people up on the pedestal and not some chupake ni rakho, you know? Well, you get the last word on this. So I'll kind of steal your example when it comes to chocolates, for example. So chocolates where, you know, cacao is grown in the southern hemisphere and then it is shipped to um, Europe, made into chocolate, and then here we kind of like package it and sell it and people are fine with it. But when it comes to our industries, I think our industries have a long way to go when it comes to sustainability. They're not perfect. But I will say that there is a frugality, there is a sustainable mindset that has come from situations like you mentioned where Mishti was banned and you have to survive. Survival was more important than anything else. So there's a long way to go, I think, but um, you know, we'll surely, if, if we work as an industry together, as an ecosystem, we can get there. And I will say that we're still more sustainable than a bar of chocolate that you get from Europe that everyone else loves. So. Thank you, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so on that very powerful note of collaboration and consistent micro efforts for the climate, I'm going to thank the panelists and draw this to a close. Thank you for bearing with us. We know we've gone over time. Thank you. A round of applause for our panelists, please. And a round of applause for the moderator, ladies and gentlemen. Fantastic. Can you all... Uh, Step a little forward uh, for a group photograph. Thank you. <laughs> Sanju is one left up. <laughs> <laughs>